Uh, thank you, everyone. So for those of you that don't know, this year at EMF, we've got pretty much a site-wide telephone network. Uh, so it's traditional-ish copper network, or you could call it a plain old telephone system. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about how that came about and the journey and what went wrong. Uh, so a little bit about me, uh, I'm Matthew, I've worked in telecoms, sort of voice over IP for 10 years, that's everything from single phones in someone's house for like a small business to hundreds of phones in hundreds of offices around the world. Uh, so I'm fascinated by communications, not just phones, but amateur radio, networking, pre-internet, BBS stuff, anything of that nature. Uh, and when I'm not playing with phones, I like to play with phones. Um, generally the more physical aspects, so sort of restoration. Uh, so this is some of my phones. Uh, these are all in pretty bad shape when I got them. Uh, they're old sort of 1940s GPO Bakelite phones. Um, so with a bit of elbow grease, it's relatively easy to get them looking brand new. Uh, just a lot of polishing and cleaning and, and all the rest of it. Uh, so before we go too far into it, there is this isn't the first time someone has done a POTS network at a hacker camp. Um, so I think Shady Tell were one of the first. Uh, they're a sort of collective of people uh, in the US that tend to run a telephone network at another hacker camp called Tor Camp. Um, so their niche, if you like, is um, they do real telephony. So they don't do IP or voice over IP. They just use T1 ISDN between all of the different sort of breakouts over the campsite. Uh, there's also the Chaos Vermitzlung. Uh, they started in 2015, as far as I know, and they actually do field telephones. So they do some of the Chaos events in Germany. Um, and their, their niche is a manual exchange. So you pick up the phone and speak with an operator and then someone manually patches you in. Uh, and then the Sleepy, who some of you will know uh, on Twitter, they ran a POTS network in 2018. So they had a single gateway in their tent and ended up serving, I think it was about 10 people in their location. Uh, so that's the, the history. Uh, and then we get to how it started. So I've got a bunch of phones. Some of them are dotted around uh, and the Bakelite ones that you saw. Uh, so I wanted to bring them to EMF to sort of connect up to the deck network. Um, so I started to look for analog telephone adapters, uh, otherwise known as ATAs, that basically convert like a traditional analog telephone to voice over IP. And specifically, I was looking for one with pulse dialing, because uh, a lot of my phones use pulse dialing, which rather than using DTMF, where you press a button and it beeps, uh, it interrupts the line. So you rotate the dial and then it opens and closes the line to signal the number. Um, so I found some Fred on a forum recommending some Grandstream ATAs and I got a couple of those uh, and they, they work really well. They support pulse dialing. Um, but Cisco were also mentioned, but I initially dismissed it. So for those of you who don't know, S Cisco is a huge sort of enterprise networking manufacturer or vendor. Um, they have voice products. But they tend to, well, I was under the impression that it was all proprietary. You had to use what's called Cisco Call Manager. Um, and I never really considered trying to do things with sort of open source voice over IP products. But I did have a small amount of Cisco gear lying around. Uh, so the, the story goes is I was looking to get hold of sort of three switches to play with some spanning tree. Um, and as you do, I was looking for listings ending soonest on eBay. And this came up, it was literally opening bid was 50 quid and no, no one had bid on it. Um, so I, I bid 50 pounds and then sure enough, I won. <laughs> and then had to figure out what I was going to do with a rack and a half of um, end of life Cisco gear. Um, so the good news is within that rack of stuff, there was a couple of things that were actually worth money. So there was a, a power distribution unit that was worth a hundred pounds and the racks themselves, I think I got about 50 pounds each for. So I ended up coming out of it with some profit and a bunch of Cisco stuff lying around. Um, so I started to play with the Cisco stuff and kind of discovered that actually it mostly just does work. They can speak pretty standard SIP and interact with other SIP things without too much effort. Um, so at that point, I started wondering, well, maybe instead of just bringing my phones, I could put a few of these around the site and other people could bring their phones. 
So I started working out pricing and stuff. I had a bunch of the 2811s, which are a kind of smallish router. Um, but it was about £80 each to upgrade them to a point where they could be used for telecoms. Um, and that would only get you 12 ports, which is quite a lot of money for a lot of, not, not many lines. Um, which is then somewhere, it was possibly on Reddit, I discovered a Cisco VG224, um, which is the same form factor as the kind of big chunky Cisco routers, but actually has 24 lines. Uh, and at the time, they were incredibly cheap. I think they've gone up a bit now because I bought them all. Um, so yeah, that was kind of when things started to develop and I started to think, hmm, maybe, maybe this could be like a thing. Um, so this is what those Cisco VG2224s look like. Um, you'll notice they've got that weird connector on the side. That's what's called an RJ21, um, which is a connector commonly used in sort of telecommunications. You might also know it as a Centronics 50 pin. I think it's used for SCSI. Um, but these cables were incredibly expensive. They're sort of like £30 each for a metre long. Um, so then it started to look less likely that it would be a thing. Um, but I put a tweet out on Twitter and a, a bunch of people replied to me and said, oh, I've got a bunch of them in my shed. You can have them for a fiver each. And I managed to get hold of them off various people for reasonable money. So at that stage, it started to look like, you know, this, this, this might actually happen. Um, so I started playing with the voice stuff and made some calls between them. And then I went off on a tangent um, so quite early on, I realized that as, as much as I love phones, people aren't going to be sitting in their tent phoning each other for hours at a time. It needs to be something more interactive. Um, so I started wondering about things that you can run over the top of a phone line. Um, so the obvious ones are faxing, modems and dial-up internet. Um, so dial-up, a few people have been experimenting with this recently. It seems to have reached a point where everyone's forgotten how bad it was and then have started to sort of dig out old modems and try to recreate it. Um, someone called Retrobytes on YouTube has a really good video made in the last six months where they kind of go through how it works in a way that's easy to understand, but they also make their own setup and go through how you can do it yourself. Um, but most of these solutions involve like a stack of modems, serial adapters, Raspberry Pis, and, and what you end up with is like a, a huge pile of spaghetti, um, which is probably okay at home, but less helpful in a tent. Um, so I found a YouTube video from someone called Zephy. Uh, they had a Cisco-based setup. Um, so Cisco had these modem cars that have basically 30 modems all built into one box. Uh, and it turns out in my huge pile of Cisco gear, I had some of the bits that were needed. Um, so I managed to get a few bits off eBay and put something together. Um, so this is what that looks like. This is a 3U Cisco 3845. Uh, and on your right are the modem cards. So they've got modules with the, the modem chips on them. Um, so that'll get you 30 modems in a single box. There's less cables and it includes the world's shortest ISDN link. So that, that red cable is ISDN. And the reason it's plugged into itself is if you want to send calls over IP, they have to hit the modem over ISDN. That's just how it works. So essentially you send a call to it over voice over IP. It loops it back out to itself over that ISDN link and then back into itself and it's too stupid to realize that it is just tr looping around for itself. There are some catches. It, they are incredibly loud, uh, really power hungry. I use kilowatts of power just testing all this stuff. Uh, and there are some limitations. So it's, it's not the ideal system, but um, it's what's available and they're fairly cheap. So I got all that working. And then, yeah, as I, as I said earlier, it turns out dial-up sucks. Um, all, all websites are so bloated now, they've all got sort of five meg of JavaScript. Um, even if you do wait, web servers tend to time out now because they just close the connection after a minute. Um, and then there aren't really that many low bandwidth options available. Even a lot of like the mobile sites and stuff, which are lower bandwidth, still kind of assume that you've got a connection from this century. Uh, so this is when I discovered Prestel or ViewData. Um, so I'd literally never heard of Prestel, despite claiming to be a, a telecoms nerd. Um, but I had heard of the Minitel system. 
So these are um, video text or view data services. They're very similar in kind of appearance and operation to teletext, which you may have seen around the site on various TVs. Um, but it's done over a phone line. So that gives you the added benefit that you can actually send data to the service. Um, so at the time, you could do things like order cinema tickets and do online banking and various interactive services. It, it was basically kind of the internet before the internet existed. Um, it runs at 1,200 board down and 75 board up. Um, the idea is that no one would type faster than 75 board, so that's fast enough. Um, but unfortunately, it didn't take off in the UK, really, just due to high costs. You had to pay like a quarterly subscription. You had to pay for the phone line and you had to pay per minute to access it. So it was just too expensive. Um, but fortunately, someone called John Newcomb has made a modern cross-platform client and server called Telstar. I highly recommend you check it out. phone calls and, and calls routing between them but then you, you have to start thinking about how you're going to cover like a, a huge festival site with this stuff um, so fortunately power and internet are already provided um, and the data and clothes are already dotted around the site which provide a waterproof home for the gateways to live in so for those of you that don't know a data and clo is basically a portaloo uh, which is used to hide switches and power in um, because it's the cheapest way to get a plastic box into a field for a week um, a lot of the, the cabling between the phones and the gateways themselves is done just with Cat5, just because it's pre-terminated. You can buy one on Amazon and get it delivered next day. And I really didn't want to be punching down cables and doing that kind of thing, which would be the more traditional way of doing it. Um, so I made a bunch of breakout boards, uh, basically PCBs with a bunch of RJ45 connectors on, just so you can walk up, patch in, and it's all self-serve and doesn't really rely on anyone doing anything. And then these were put in buckets outside the dust enclosed. So you might have seen a bucket or possibly kicked it or tripped over it. Um, and that's where all the patching happens. So this is what that looks like. That is a Datum Globe before it's even got a network switch in. This was super early on sort of the Tuesday last week. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a portaloo. Uh, that metal box on the, on the toilet seat is a voice gateway. And then outside you've got the bucket. And then the photo shows the breakout board. So that big chunky connector at the top is the RJ21. Um, fortunately, you can get those connectors fairly cheaply from AliExpress like everything else. Uh, and then you've got the lines broken out below. So the, e each of those voice gateways has 24 lines. That's split into 12 individual lines and then 12 trunk, uh, three ports of four lines. So if you want to take four lines to a village or Josh's camper van or anywhere you like, you can just run an Ethernet cable with four lines on it. Uh, and then we get to the back end. So obviously the, all the voice gateways need something to talk to, to route calls between them and to route calls to the, the deck phone and the various other systems on site. Um, so it's all built from scratch using open source software. There are some products sort of like free PBX and stuff where you get like a telecom server in a box and you just install it. The, the downside is they're not particularly easy to customize and we had some kind of unique situations that we had to counter for, so I mostly wrote it from scratch. Um, everything runs in plain Docker, mostly just because it's nice and easy, um, and it's easy to sort of redeploy stuff and move it around. Um, and all the voice gateways send calls to a central Camelio based SIP proxy. So Camelio is a SIP proxy, um, and it's, it's incredibly lightweight and efficient. So you might have heard of Asterisk. Asterisk does things like media, so IVRs, DTMF, faxing, uh, conference calls, voicemail, all that good stuff, but as a result, it's kind of more inefficient. Uh, so I opted to use Camellia in the middle. And then there is a Python and Redis-based API, um, which is used for sort of routing decisions. There is an asterisk box there. It does voice announcements, so it tries to replicate some of the BT announcements, like uh, this number is unavailable, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there is some monitoring. Uh, it's Prometheus and Grafana uh, with smoke ping. I didn't invest a huge amount of time in that, and I probably should have done, but it, it mostly works. If one of them switches off, uh, my phone vibrates, so that's, that's good enough, I think. Uh, and there is a bit of free radius in there, so there's 
SIP proxy generates call records um, and they're stored in free radius just, just to generate statistics. I, I don't really care so much who's calling who and all that data is going to get deleted. Um, but it's just good to know how many, how many phones are out there and um, how many calls and how many minutes and that kind of stuff. Um, so successes, it, it mostly worked, was a good start. Um, there's, there's 20 voice gateways deployed around the site. There's mostly in DKs, but there are some, there's one in the bar that we're going to set up later. Um, there's 50 unique users, so that's, that's 50 people have bought phones or used the, the phones dotted around the site. Um, there has been 500 calls, that's both between different POTS phones, between POTS and DECT, and to some of the, the services that other people have set up. Um, five hours worth of calls. There's been 100 plus faxes. There might actually be more because I don't necessarily know who's got a fax machine and who hasn't, but from the fax machines that I know of, there's been over 100 faxes sent. Um, someone's also set up a cat fax hotline. I highly recommend you ring it. It's a real person. It's not even automated. Uh, they're, up, they're up in York hack space. So yeah, give them a call. Um, perhaps not at four o'clock in the morning because it is quite literally a telephone in someone's tent. Um, and fax to Twitter has proven to be incredibly popular. Um, so if you go on Twitter and look at EMF facsimile, um, if you send a fax to the, the number tweet, uh, it will appear on Twitter. Uh, we're hopefully going to set one of those up in the bar later today. Uh, and people have bought like a whole load of cool things. Um, I've got some pictures I'll show you shortly. Um, so I was going to call this slide failures, but the whole thing has been a bit of a learning experience. And I've kind of drawn the conclusion that there aren't really sort of failures at EMF. It's more like missed goals, stuff that you can do next time. Um, and... To be fair, if everyone did everything they wanted to achieve the first time around, then there would be no need to have a second, second festival. So, yeah, these are, these are missed goals rather than failures. So things ran dramatically behind schedule. I kind of totally underestimated the logistics involved. It's quite easy to sit at home in front of a computer playing with software and totally miss the fact that you've got to walk around a huge site and, and put stuff in, in portaloos and stuff. Uh, so some phones were distributed around the site and didn't work for various reasons. Bits were left at home. One of them is physically broken. Um, Dial-up dial internet hasn't happened yet, but hopefully we're going to do that later today. And some installations haven't made it to the bars, but again, we're going to try to sort that out later today. But the good news was people still loved it. Even, even when everything was broken, everything was on fire, people were still coming up to me and telling me how amazing it was. And I'd kind of say, well, yeah, but, but none of it works. And they'd be like, well, the, the fact that you've even attempted it is amazing. Um, so I've, I've now got some pro tips. I wasn't really planning on this slide, but it's kind of been a bit of a journey, so I thought I'd include it. Um, so if you're planning to do some crazy huge project to EMF, I highly recommend it. Um, just, just do it. Um, and people are awesome. So I had so many offers of help and people saying thanks and like positive feedback. Um, so yeah, the next one, help, help people help you. So a big problem I had is basically the whole setup, everything existed in my head. So there were, there were multiple people asking how they could help and there was just no real way that I could easily tell them what I needed doing. So if you're planning a big project, I highly recommend in advance before you get here, making a plan for people to help you. So that could be sort of printed instructions. If someone needs to go put something in a bar, put it all in one box with everything they need. So you can just give them that one box and tell them to do that thing. Um, so I think that's a huge thing. I was kind of overwhelmed by the amount of people that wanted to help. But so you, yeah, if, I recommend making that as easy as possible. Um, next one, do much, as much as possible before you arrive. So some stuff I had tested like six months ago, but hadn't touched since and just assumed everything would be fine. Um, and it, it was not fine. Um, so try and do as much as you can before you get here. I found that, you know, sitting in an office chair in front of two screens, doing software stuff at home with a coffee machine and stuff is all, all very well and nice and easy. But then when you're in a tent in like a folding camping chair and it's raining outside, it gets considerably more difficult. Um, prioritize things and expect things to not get finished. I think 
it happens to just about everyone at EMF that tries to put together some big project. I think you should just expect it and you should have like nice to haves and, and prioritize things and not, not get too stressed if something doesn't happen. Um, and then, then the, the final thing is just enjoy it. Um, there's no point kind of killing yourself just to try and finish something. If, if it's, if it's not looking like it's going to happen, just, just, just don't do it. There's always next time. Um, so now we get to the pictures. Um, so like I said, people have bought some really cool stuff. Um, some of it's sort of dotted around the campsite. Some people have come up to the amateur radio village to kind of show it off. Um, so this is an Epson PX8. I know very little about it, but it's a very early laptop with an LCD display. Uh, it's got an acoustic cuppa and then next to it is a, a 746 phone. So that's kind of 70s. We didn't manage to get it working, unfortunately, yesterday, but fingers crossed we might be able to do something with it today. Um, so I've, I've got an acoustic coupler at home. I didn't bring it because it needs fixing, but I would love to see more acoustic couplers next time because they're amazing. Someone also bought a bat phone. It's literally the Batmobile as a phone, uh, which I was super impressed with. And someone bought an Amstrad emailer. Uh, this is a posh one. It's an E3, which has a keyboard and a games controller, apparently. Um, so I would love to see some Amstrad emailers working. I have read information that they apparently brick themselves if you plug them into a phone network and they can't phone home. So it'd be good if someone could find like some kind of workaround or fix for that because it would be cool if everyone could have an Amstrad emailer in their tent. Uh, another village another village bought a vintage BT fax machine, a proper thermal one with a roll uh, and a very yellowed BT phone. Um, and they actually challenged us to a game of noughts and crosses and hangman, uh, which was awesome. It was like the, the, the slowest, longest game of noughts and crosses you've ever seen. Uh, and someone bought a uh, Apple Newton, so it's like a PDA with a little plug-in modem. They were sending faxes to Twitter from that, which was incredible. I think a, a lot of this stuff, people haven't e either bought it and have never used it, or um, they've had it since the 80s and have not used it for 30 years. So people were loving finding an excuse to actually bring it out and use it again. Um, so we are recruiting. Um, so this year was about getting things kind of bootstrapped and increasing visibility. So more people know about it, know, more people know what to expect next time and, and what to bring. Um, so we need more people to do more things. Uh, we've got all roles available from software to, to logistics to graphics design. If you, if you want to get involved, um, the more the merrier, really. Uh, you can find the Twitter, Q Telecom, or, or grab me around the site if you want to get involved, because it'd be good to do some more cool stuff. Um, speaking with people already, the, there is hopefully going to be bigger and better things next year. There's been sort of offers of equipment and things which are all much appreciated and should be able to enable us to do more cool things next year. And uh, yeah, we'll be back. So fingers crossed, if, if we're invited back, we'll be back in 2024 and do more more cool telecoms things. Um, and that is pretty much the conclusion of the talk. Uh, I just wanted to say like a big thank you to everyone that's helped either on site with putting phones up and laying cable, uh, a bunch of people on various IRC channels and forums that have all helped with like how to get this ancient Cisco gear working. Um, and yeah, that's me. So thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, um, I will be loitering in the bar, which is next door. Uh, and then we'll probably head back to the amateur radio village. So if you want to come send a fax to Twitter or check out the view data system on a BBC micro, come stop by and we can show you some cool stuff. Thank you very much.